And let's see, I guess, roll call. Ashley, do you carry that out for us? Or do we just uh, make note? Just, uh, okay. All right, just right now, we're all, it's 3.02 and we're all present at this time except for Jill. Uh, approval of today's agenda. I look for a motion for that. So moved. Seconds? Second. Any um, discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed the same. All right. Study session and thanks for coming in for our get together this afternoon. And Dr. Funk, I believe you'll take it away. Okay. Thank you. So we're going to do something a little bit different this year than we have uh, historically. A lot of times we review the prior year, but I think we've got so many balls in the air for this summer. I think it's a good opportunity for us to review what's coming down the pike here as a school district. So what we're going to do this year is we'll, we'll just real quickly I'll pop up the district goals we've had. I'll show you a little bit of demographic information on how we're changing. Then we've just got some proposed new goals, not asking you to approve anything this afternoon. Just here's something we're thinking of for goals. And then really getting into the, the planning for 2021. Um, and we've got a long list here, and uh, don't know if we'll get to the special education piece at the bottom, but uh, um, we'll see, see if we can here, and uh, if not, we'll, what we will do is we'll put that uh, probably at the study session in, uh, in August if we, if we don't get through everything on here. Um, so that's kind of a, a quick overview of what we, we plan on doing. Uh, so this slide up here is, is kind of a comparative slide on the left. You have what our district look like with English learners, special education students, free and reduced students, and homeless for this past school year. And on the right um, is what we have for the upcoming year. A uh, couple things to notice on there is um, our special education population. It's never real accurate, but we're a little higher this upcoming year than we were last year. Um, that's always a, a number in flux. Our free and reduced numbers are going up. And as you can see, our English language learners, where English is not the primary language spoken at home, is going up a percent, which is a, a pretty significant move for, uh, for our district. Um, enrollment by ethnicity, I always find this information fascinating because we are quickly evolving as a, as a school district. If you just take a look at our white numbers, in 2019, we were almost 64% white. In 2020-21, we are at 60% white. So we are quickly evolving. Um, I think when I came to the district in 2009, we were 78% white. So, um, and, and you can see some of the areas we are where we are changing. Our Hispanic population has gone up a couple percent. Our uh, um, Asian population continues to trend upward. And we've had a slight reduction in our black or African American population. So, that, yeah, what we'll do is we'll send we'll send the whole slide packet to you. Yeah, and people, it's just it's just good to be aware of as as we uh, are are evolving as a district. Uh, there's our pathways document. Um, you know, I think one of the areas that we've really been focusing on is at the in the green there, the the secondary level operating on um, you know, community partnerships and, and various pathways, um, be it uh, mentorship programs, internship programs, school to work programs, um, AP. We just got some AP results last week. We'll be sharing those with you in August. And we're waiting to see in the next day or two what we have for AP scholars. Um, and then, of course, our, our traditional curriculum at the, at the high school. Those are really what, what guide us as an administration and, and as a board, I believe, when we're, we're looking at what we want for our district. Uh, we went through the values exercise a few years ago as, as a board. Um, those are what we embrace, respect, integrity, compassion, and collaboration. Now here are the goals from 2019 and 20. Um, and again, we're not going to spend a lot of time reviewing 1920 today, but uh, um, we wanted to continue to develop leaders at the building and team level. And I, and I would 
Yeah, I would uh, um, state that through our high reliability schools process, we really had engaged teacher leaders at the building level throughout this, uh, this past school year. And uh, I, I think we, we've uh, seen some real good collaboration throughout the district. Um, engage the community in conversations about a high school curricular redesign. John Double has done wonderful things meeting with, uh, I'd say, 80 businesses in the community about their needs and, uh, um, and what we have uh, going on at the high school and how we can adjust uh, meeting, you know, the needs of our student population where we have, you know, 36% of our students go on to get a four-year college degree. So we're moving in the right direction there. Um, we continue to try to attract and retain talented individuals throughout our school system. Um, this past year, I don't think we have any change in the administration at all. And uh, we, we've had some late retirements as a result of the COVID um, uh, of people who are just concerns about health that uh, has been unique we haven't seen this summer. Our, our fund balance is about 12.5%. Um, that's really about where we started the year. And so we've maintained it. And I know the board has adjusted the fund balance level. Um, so I've, I've made that adjustment for future slide. <clears throat> you know, we tried to get out and visit a few of the outlying school um, communities this year. That was not real successful. I, I think we should tie in some sort of other activity with that as a school board when we go up there, and, and I think we can talk about that for the future. And then the school board did go through uh, a board self-evaluation, and uh, at least one board member did phase three training. And uh, so we are starting to look at, at the board level on how, uh, how the board can improve. So that, that's real quick. And uh, you've got my list of what I accomplished this past year, what the district did the other day when you were doing my evaluation. So we're not going to uh, spend too much more time on that part of it today. Here are some proposed goals for next year, and they've shifted what we are doing just because of the environment that we are living in. Um, one is to prepare the district to provide a quality education for students in a pandemic environment. Whatever that environment is, we want to make sure our students have a quality education. Two, we want to ensure systems are in place to provide a safe environment for students and staff. So we want to do the best thing we can to make sure we are safe for everybody associated with the district. And you're going to hear some, some of the planning for this that uh, is going on today. Uh, three, from a professional development staff development angle, we really are focused on, on cultural competencies and trauma responsiveness. Mary Jo is going to get a little bit into that today as far as uh, some of the plans for that with our staff this year. Um, four, we're still following the high reliability schools process, and we want it's much harder than the level one, but we want effective teaching in every single classroom. And there's a whole process that goes along with that that uh, our teacher leaders and uh, building teams will uh, be really taking the lead on. Uh, number five, either this year or next year, we're going to have to pass an operating levy, and Jennifer's going to talk more about that um, later this afternoon. Uh, to maintain our district operations as we have our levy will be expiring uh, in 2022. We want to maintain the fund balance. And uh, number seven, we want to work with the board to build a cohesive team to lead the district. So these are just some proposed thoughts. Um, again, we'll, we'll be sending all of this out, and we won't be asking you to adopt these till probably sometime in August. But this is what we were putting together as, a, as an admin team. Um, as we were planning planning for this upcoming school year. Questions on any of that? What do you envision for number seven? Uh, working with the board, and I, again, I think that's uh, something that we can talk about as a board. Okay, and so building a co cohesive team, you mean just this team at the table right now, or are you talking about a different team? The team in this, at the table. about, um, well, I guess it doesn't matter what number it is, <laughs> number five, uh, the operating levy. I know we're not doing that now or anything, but um, 
if we did pass something like that, would that raise property taxes or would they stay pretty much the same? Yeah, Jennifer's going to get into the details of that. Okay. But if, so if we went and did a renewal, straight renewal, and we said, so we don't have to approve it till next November, but then if we don't approve it, we don't, then we're, then we're out the money. So one of the things for the board to consider is going out this November during the general election. Um, but if we went for a straight renewal, taxes would go down for the local taxpayer. Okay, so if we went for, if we want to renew at the level we're at, they would go down. Um, we're, we've got some other proposals that we want you to take a look at today. But there's, there's, again, today's just informational planning. We're not asking you to make any decisions at all. Um, but um, so if we, if we went to the voters and said, yep, we want a straight renewal of currently where we're at funding-wise, your taxes will go down, and she'll show you the specific numbers when we when we get to that. Thank you. Yep. Okay. So the first thing we're going to do is we did a distance learning survey um, at the uh, end of the school year to get some perspective from families on what they thought about this distance learning environment and really takeaways that we we got from it so that if we do go into distance learning in the fall, how can we improve things and make things better? So, and we don't know what we're gonna do in the fall yet, but we're gonna, we'll talk through the different options we're looking at coming up here in a minute. So the first thing I'm gonna do is have Mary Jo come up and, or do you wanna talk from behind me or what do you wanna do, Mary Jo, or come up? Or I can switch with you and you can sit here? If they can hear you? Uh, yeah, let's just do that. So she's going to, she's going to uh, once she gives Ashley permission, um, it was under mine this morning. She'll, she'll share, share with you the actual numbers and what people thought. And we had over 500 people take this survey. And, um, and then a lot of the comments that uh, you'll be able to see that uh, what people thought, both good and bad. <laughs> so I know generally in using a shared mic, um, we don't use the windscreen and they have to be wiped off. I don't know if you want to wipe it off in between. I would, I would recommend that. Um, yep, so like Mike said, we gave this at, when school finished, we sent out the survey to all parents. And it was quick, simple, seven questions and a place for comments. And we broke out the data, um, I'll get started here, by grade level, because we wanted to also use this as a, as a learning tool as we move forward. So the first question was pretty simple, just tell us your student's grade. and. We also gave parents a choice that if you have more than one student in the comment section, you can make more comments regarding the other students that you didn't maybe put here for their grade, or you can do a survey for each student that you have. And so 558 surveys were completed, and it's broken out there by elementary and secondary, um, but we know more um, student data was collected because parents did comment. And you'll see in, when we get to the comment section that then they talked about if they filled the survey out for their second grader, then they talked about their fourth grader or their sixth grader in the comments of what things went well or what things they w would have changed. Can you break down how many students were secondary and how many total elementary? Like District number? Yeah. Um, Is that roughly can you somebody look that up while I'm talking? I don't know the exact, but somebody can pull it up right behind me there, too. And do we know um, how much percentage of the population took the survey? We don't know the exact. So what we know is how many surveys were completed. 
and then depending, I mean, this is, so this is 558 parents completing the survey. If they had two, three, or four kids, they had the option. So it's, you know, it's not an exact science, no. And I guess so I'm just going to ask the same question then. Do we know a ballpark of how many students we have secondary and elementary? So 7 through 12. Thank you. And and did pre-K were they involved in this at all, or just starting at K? Uh, K twelve. So then, question two was: As a parent, I felt my student was supported during distance learning, and you can see, you know, if, again, we broke it out by elementary and secondary because moving forward, the elementary building leadership teams will be looking at elementary data, secondary, secondary. Um, but if we look at sec secondary, 57% felt their students were agreed that they were supported or strongly agreed. And then 43% either neutral or disagreed or strongly agreed. And you'll see some more details behind some of these numbers, I think, when you see some of the comments that parents put. I was very transparent on what parents put in their comments. I didn't change anything other than if a teacher name was listed, I just pulled that out. Um, so just general data there. And then question three was just giving us an idea of how much time were children, students working on schoolwork during the day as they were home during distance learning. And these were the options we gave parents and the, there's a breakdown. Anything surprising there when you look at that? Questions? And we did see that in the comments that uh, Wednesday parents appreciated or students appreciated that catch up day. Uh, question four was, I thought the amount of activity and work for my student was just right, too much, not enough. talking about distance learning and moving forward this year and all of that and I'm saying so everything he did was amazing and so it was new content he was learning that and I kind of knew that but I kind of forgot so it's kind of a good job okay awesome I have a question so we we put a lot of emphasis on the trades 
And so when you have distance learning at the secondary level, is there many opportunities to provide a quality of, of trade type of training? Obviously, there were some missed opportunities with the hands-on through distance learning um, in MDE's guidance for moving forward this year with technical education. Even if we go into distance learning mode, they're saying that for the technical piece, welding, construction, the hands-on things, that if we can make it work through very small group, again, we don't know what the decision is, but they've already addressed that to say we know there was some missed opportunities for those, those um, pathways. So when you look at these numbers, that basically could be why it's not enough? Yeah. Anybody else have any comment on that? Okay. Uh, question five. As a parent, the level of support I needed to give my student to accomplish distance learning was, and you can see elementary and secondary uh, pretty similar. Uh, maybe disappointing for us was um, a third of the parents are saying it was too much for us as parents. Yeah, we've already talked about that. Principals have already said they would do videos and um, do some training sessions so parents know, know what to expect for the online pieces. The children here, though, that came the too much support, were they thinking that they were being contacted too much? Is that what was going on? Well, we read it that as a parent, how much support am I needing to give my child in the home for them to be successful for distance learning? Okay. But there's one coming up, Angie, that will, I know what you're trying to say, that's coming up next. I have a comment that we have in our presence today a, a active teacher and two active parents and an active student. So uh, I encourage you to contribute uh, your insight relative to these issues, you know, as we go along from the various roles you play. We can take advantage of that. Well, and I guess um, I'm a little, su oh, sorry, back on that <coughs> slide we were just looking at. Yep. I'm a little surprised that the secondary parents felt as much or even a tad bit more that they needed to help their students, whereas elementary kids, the ones that don't even know how to read yet and are learning to read, they obviously need their parents, and so that does surprise me. I don't know if it is more of the apps and the technology or if our secondary just needs that much support uh, working through the curriculum. Um, I would think that too, Jill, when I first saw that, and then when you see some of the comments coming up, I think it will be explained a little bit more where you see secondary parents saying, I have no idea if they were turning in their assignments. I didn't know how to check on things anymore. So, I'm, so I think there was just that, it was a learning tool for us of like, okay, we, you know, this distance learning was our first time through this spring. We've learned some things from what parents told us and how do we improve upon them, so. Um, And then, Angie, here's, I think, what you were thinking. By the end of distance learning, how would you rate the overall communication from staff? And, you know, just right, um, elementary, secondary, elementary, a little bit more, but not enough at the secondary level. I mean, over a third of our parents said not enough. And it goes back to, I think, as we were distance learning, our first time through, 
maybe didn't have every, everything solidified on how do we communicate and what does it look like and what are the expectations from teachers, from principals, from district staff for communication. So again, a learning tool for us. And what types of staff other than teachers would be contacting the general student? So we, if you were a paraeducator in the district, you, if you were not assigned at the child care center um, or child care at Halverson, you were assigned to support students. And so uh, you had a roster of students and you would be making phone calls home, working with them on completing assignments, um, answering questions, making sure we weren't losing students to just shutting down. So we had a lot of um, paraeducators making calls, educational assistants, and then um, our success coaches were on phone, call, you know, on Zoom phone calls all day long. Mary Jo, uh, as a former teacher, I distinctly recall that probably one of my worst areas was communicating with parents, communicating with the home. It, it just wasn't convenient. And um, I think in the face of this pandemic, there are certain advantages that we're realizing because with distant learning, that should be built into the system. It would be a lot easier. I would have welcomed that arrangement where I'd have a platform where I could regularly communicate, not just with my students, but with their parents, since mm -hmm. their, the communications is in the same line. Mm -hmm. Agreed. But again, you know, the, during that two-week planning period, coming back from spring break, and oh my gosh, distance learning. We've never done this before. Everybody was running, everyone, we're all trying to figure it out. And now we're looking back, we're getting feedback from parents, from teachers, paraeducators, um, success coaches, and we've learned a lot. And so distance learning is going to look different. Um, there'll be the things we did well, well, we'll keep, and then there's some things, obviously we've learned, that we need to improve upon, um, have more consistency among classrooms, expectations, et cetera. What during that normal times when every year was like the previous, you know, we kept fine-tuning everything we did. Well, now this is perhaps going to be our second year with some degree of distance learning, and uh, we're just getting started in mm -hmm. this. There are a lot of opportunities out there. Yeah, I mean, there's simple things we learned that, you know, we had, like I said, we had a lot of different staff members calling homes, calling parents, talking with students, Zoom meetings or Google Meets. And within the first week or two, success coaches started calling saying, uh, Mary Jo, I need training on Google Classroom. I'm trying to help these families. I don't understand it myself or whatever the online platform was. And so next day we had, you know, media specialists quick putting together screencastifies and demos so we could just send the video links out to our staff to say, okay, here's how you use these so you can support parents. And they're like, okay, solved their problem, great. And then we moved on to the next next thing that would come up. So it was a busy time. Uh, don't know that I've ever had to be so on it for you know every minute of the day, but it was, yeah, it was something. <laughs> And when paras would contact a home, maybe a secondary home, do they talk to both the parent and the student, or, or how does that happen? Uh, you know, it was mostly Google Meets for the secondary, working with students. Um, I know in parent feedback or just friends I talked to, they could, you know, hear what was going on in the classroom. I mean, think about open classrooms now, because you're on Google Meets, and you have maybe your parent in the house, and instruction happening. So parents were contacting parents, or teachers were contacting parents if there were concerns or they weren't hearing from students, checking in with them. Um, but I don't know regularly if parent calls were being made. I think that it's always a tricky thing in communicating with parents because every parent wants to be communicated with differently, has different needs, you know what I mean? So unless that Parent is initiating that communication. Sometimes it gets kind of tricky to get this just perfect, I think. my Our communication was fine, but I was lucky. It was home doing my thing, doing my teaching with my son. I could check up on him. 
and then anytime we had a question, I would send an email or I would have my son advocate for himself and send an email. And we always got really quick responses. So it right. worked perfect for us, but I know everyone's kind of got their, or, or their understanding of the technology. So some people might have like, they don't even know where to start for questions maybe, but once again, moving forward, everyone should be a little bit further along in this. So it's only going to get better and easier. One of the concerns I would have, and I, we probably have no way to track it, but I'm guessing there were a lot of families that chose just not to do anything. I'm guessing attendance wasn't there. Was there any ability, I, I'm guessing none of these parents would have filled out the information, but um, if they're not attending, how do we get them there? Uh, some of the parents I'm guessing were just so overwhelmed and I don't know how ESL would have played in with that as well. So daily attendance was part of the requirement with distance learning. Um, you know, there were several opportunities for secondary students to check in during the day, uh, elementary. If we were not hearing from families, um, I can think of an elementary family where the principal and a success coach went out to see how can, you know, not going in the house, but going to the door, how can we help you? Is your device working? Well, it turns out, um, you know, the technology needed some help. Principal got them kind of set up, did the little training outside on the step, and off they went. And so it, it was taking some door-to-door -door phone calls, whatever it took. Was there any uh, statistics, and you know, maybe you'll cover this in a little bit, on the, on the failures of students, like a certain percentage? And I know it's, it's difficult when you have multiple classes like at the secondary level and that. Did we do anything like that? So direction from MDE for the spring distance learning was because this is all new to us, because we don't know if everybody has connectivity, although in Albert Lee we did, but that was an issue across the state. Um, because, I mean, kudos to Kathy and the tech department and, well, Jennifer for funding it. Kudos to you all. Um, we were the only big nine school that had devices one-to-one -one and the only district in the Big Nine, I don't know about other districts, but I do know Big Nine because I regularly meet weekly with them, to have hotspots for all families who didn't have internet. So we did not have that issue. The issue could have been families didn't necessarily know how to use the technology, but we had the technology. So uh, for instance, in some of the other districts, like Otana was, for its elementary students, was sending home packets they, they couldn't Google Meet, they didn't have hotspots, and that was just a reality out there. You know, moving forward, they're working on that, but that to us was such a huge kudo that we had started e-learning a couple years, and e-learning is different than distance learning, but we had started the process of kind of the mindset of learning from home and using devices. Now, we weren't at the level we needed to be for distance learning completely, but we had the running start to say, all right, we're kind of did this e-learning piece and now we're moving on to fully um, more online learning with Google Meet, virtual lessons, et cetera. Um, so that was our big bonus. And now to get answering your questions about uh, failing students, Dave, is because all of that was out there, it's a pandemic, the, the states, and districts are just trying to do the best we can as we're working through it our first time through. Their guidance was at this time we, we due to equity issues, um, all types of equity issues, whether it's not having internet, um, poverty, et cetera, we ask that students not, not be failed during distance learning. Take their third quarter, th take the third quarter grade. And so that, that's really what happened. Gotcha. Okay, sorry. And is that continuing for the coming year? No. Okay, so it's very clear in their guidance to have rigorous instruction. And so that's why we have to really now step it up and what did we learn and move forward. Okay, because this year they had said no F, so, but we had decided the pass or fail part, correct? We had initially said that, pass and fail. 
and then after as MDE was getting lots of feedback from districts of we're not hearing from families, um, they don't have internet, et cetera, et cetera, MDE later came and said, really consider why are you failing that student? Have we treated all kids equitably? And it's more the past part that I'm wondering about. Um, so rather than give ABC just to pass, was that a state guidance or, or district guidance? The ABC? Yeah. So the district guidance was the state guidance was to don't fail and you can use more credit. The local guidance was you were going to go past no credit unless the student used an ABC which was at the entry level yeah. way requirement and then we will work with the families to give them the, the equivalent of a grade based upon their performance. Okay and then how does that part moving in go moving into this um, new year? So we'll be working with teams. We've already started a um, couple weeks ago we started with um, this survey and uh, Dr. Funk called the ALEA, all the administrators, the EL coordinator, technology, integration person, to just start a complete brainstorming session of start planning for this year. We've only had our first meeting. Obviously, we're anxiously awaiting. We wish we had the announcement of what are we doing because there's a lot of work to be done yet. And, and received, grading is... And we received no guidance from anybody on what grade they would pass. Yeah. As far as the ABC part. And uh, now again, this was in May. So in May, then we asked parents that as we get, as we start planning as a district for the fall, um, and again, the decision will have to be based on what the MDE says, we just asked parents at this time, would you send your student to on-site, or it could be a combination of on-site hybrid in the fall, or would you choose a distance learning only where your, your student will be off-site? And... Um, that's a percentage, which ironically the same for both. Again, that's why I'm saying that was May. So what will happen as soon as we get guidance from May, May, early June. We sent it out the end of May and um, yeah, very early part of June, asked, we closed the survey. So once we have guidance from MDE, um, it would be great if it was this week, but they're saying the week of May 20, or, um, July 27th, we have another survey ready to go because at that point we need to plan of all the scenarios and parents at that time will be given the options and then they just have to firm up with us what they're doing so we can plan accordingly for staffing, instructional needs, et cetera. Do you have any feel yet on, regardless of what the state guidance is, perhaps they allow an on-site hybrid situation. If we have a family that wants to only do the distance learning, um, I know they can always make choices for the safety of their child. Are we, uh, would we be set up or would we set each one of those families up to be just strictly distance learning? You know what, that's the next part of my, um, Five, can I get to all our scenarios? Um, and this, this will give you a little more insight. I mean, some of you have students in the district, so obviously you, you've been through distance learning. But when you read the comments, it, it gave more clarity on some more things we need to do as a district. Um, and again, the comments, I kept broken out by elementary comments and secondary. So when we, when we go in our breakout groups again, with staff, um, after we know the MD announcement, elementary can look at those comments to say, what are we learning from this? What, what should we consider? And vice versa, secondary. So, um, so the first one, and I have seven pages of comments, and I'm just gonna let you read them, just so you can process. Um, I'll have a couple comments along the way. Feel free if you have comments, but, um, so we'll start with elementary. 
and then we'll go to secondary. And again, there's seven slides with comments. So if you just read those. I think the one thing we learned is the third comment there of just as a district or buildings, um, we just need more consistency on what are we doing across all classrooms, expectations, et cetera. Turning too fast, just tell me I'll go back. And then these are the secondary comments. The comment about Schoology was stressful. Just FYI, we are not renewing our contract with Schoology, and we're going to go grades 3 through 12 with Google Classroom, which is awesome. Currently, we're 3 to 7, and so this will be a great transition as 8th graders head to the high school with Google Classroom. And it's easier for parents. Parent feedback was stronger in Google Classroom as well. Schoology was super busy. So there's some takeaways, obviously, from this that, um, again, it's tools for us to move forward. Um, the other thing I want to mention is MDE also did a survey. They, they did theirs mid-June to the end of June and released the results um, either last week or the week before. Um, but in that survey, so a month later than ours, 53% 53 per, 53 of parents in, in the survey said that distance learning was bad to a very bad idea. Statewide, uh, the MDE, yeah, if I didn't say that. Um, and then they 
uh, 64% of their parents who completed the MDE survey statewide said that 64% of them would send their children to school in the fall. And of those 64%, then the question was, do you want full-time or part-time? And 95%, I want full-time in school. So that was a survey in June. Ninety, yes. So I think there were some clear messages you could see in the comment sections um, of things we need to work on, consistency, communication, et cetera. Um, speaking of consistency, is that something um, to be worked on or this being discussed uh, with teachers and stuff? Is the, um, the, Google, the Google Meets, the actual classroom face-to-face -face time? Because um, I know even m other teachers that I've taught with from my consortium and in Southland, you know what I mean? It was a mod podge. Everybody did something different. Mm -hmm. And um, my son didn't attend any, but I think, I don't know if they were going on, but I wasn't too strict with him because he was getting his stuff done. Everything was going well. He didn't really want them. But um, I think it would be nice to have something consistent so all parents know, hey, we have, you know, your, this is your class schedule to however, then what if the kids are baby? Yeah, there's a lot of other factors. Yeah, there but too. that is the next stage. So, again, um, we're waiting for MDE to announce so we can concretely start really moving forward. And the next stage is we're going to bring in our building leadership teams, teachers, admin, et cetera, and now do the next stage of planning because that's what needs to be addressed. What does virtual learning look like? Google Meets, et cetera, et cetera. So a lot of planning. And we thought about do we go now? It's like, nope, let's wait till we have a decision so we know, actually know what we're planning for because it, it is going to be very time consuming to have this planning make consistency, expectations, et cetera, so. What is the timeline for, I mean, you hear from MDE and you've got a minute, and then. So they'll let us know by Monday. Okay. Be back for July 27th. We can go through the next one. Yeah, so okay. we're going to be going oh, through okay, gotcha. Kathy, Mejo, Jennifer, who's next, set of slides, and talking all about the scenario, okay. different planning, what we're doing. So we're really, um, it, there's three scenarios, actually Mike points out there's really, f really four is, first one is in person, everybody here, second one that we'll talk about in a second is hybrid, um, meaning one, like an A-B schedule, the A students come on one day and the B students come on another day to bring down the populations in the building. The third scenario is that parent who says, yep, I don't want either of those scenarios, I'm going to choose distance learning only. Um, but really the fourth scenario is even if we're in person, a building could shut down and before, you know, if COVID hit strikes um, severely, then if we're in person or hybrid, we're going to turn that building into a distance learning. So there is lots of scenarios and it's going to still be a bit in flux as we move forward here, but having one concrete way to get started is uh, our plan once we know what we can do. So scenario one, uh, in-person learning for all students. And this just outlines the first bullets there are just what MDE is telling us that we need to um, consider. This is their guidance of creating as much space as feasible. Um, we can still do activities, um, distance marking and buildings. You're talking about that in yours, right? On signs? Yeah. Okay, I'll let that. Jennifer will talk more on that, so I'll, I'm just going to just quick review some of these because they're not surprising and I'm sure things you've already read. Um, Non-essential visitors not allowed in the buildings. Um, and then self-service self food. And then as far as instruction, um, some of the things we talked about through distance learning, what worked and what didn't in the survey is, number one, we know we're going to have to screen students to figure out where are they starting this fall because if we didn't have all kids on all the time, doing all the assignments, 
all kids are going to come in at, at different levels. So um, that will be part of our planning of we'll use the fast screener, which we've used in the past, but then really looking at the learning plans for individual students. Um, teachers will be meeting to go through the data, look at the interventions we need to um, consider, uh, what staff will be assigned to support, and we may be in all likelihood reteaching some content from the spring. If you're a kindergartner who missed your spring, spring quarter in phonics, we could have been doing it online, but if you weren't there, or it's very hard to teach phonics online it, with all the hands-on manipulations, there may be some reteaching in the, in the forward-moving grade. But again, this is where the building, the teacher teams will be working to really determine that as, as we get students back. Um, and the Did we learn some tricks? Oh, I, I'm sorry, I was thinking um, EL, phonics, I'm yeah. like, okay, yeah, extended school year. Um, I think having targeted and ESY was beneficial for us because it was a small group. We, we got some more tools in our toolbox on what worked, what didn't, and now bring those things forward. So, um, yes, thank you. Um, and again, setting expectations for the structures and um, as far as tech integration, we're looking at how do we really streamline our online platform? Because as individual teachers, I may be found an online tool I really like, but if we get too many of those things out there, that's really hard for students. And so um, that's been Burke who's kind of leading that charge of tech integration of really going through our online platforms and, and working with teachers to say what are the best ones? and what ones can we let go. So there's a lot of work like that going on. Of, so those are the positives of going through this. It's really forced us to be better uh, with tech integration as well. What is the scenario of trying to find all the space possible to spread kids out and all that and every kid being there? I mean, how far can we spread kids out? I, I know it says we don't have to strictly enforce six feet, but I mean, how about, like, in a classroom, how, how far do we think we can be spreading them out? I don't have many concerns with any elementary because we have some small class sizes already in our elementary. Where, where this is going to be more of a concern for us is that we have five floors. And we have, you know, that class is a few, well, 30, 30, 32 kids. Um, that's going to be more of a concern. But as you can see, they, they put, put a caveat in here. So, and I've been very purposeful with, with the administration on this, and I said, don't go too far down the road here on this, because you don't know what it's going to look like, and I don't want you doing all these plans, and then suddenly the next house we're going to be doing something else. So, we're having the initial conversations, the thoughts, I hope they kind of think about this as a, but we haven't put together a lot of full-blown um, scenarios Yeah, we are. We are. That's okay. part of it. You'll hear that. When yeah, I would like to ask anyway, <laughs> right. but yeah, especially if we're not on social media. No, Jennifer's going to address that. So okay. Yeah. I will do it. And I'll keep going so I don't take the whole time until 5 o'clock. Sorry. <laughs> um, and again, this is kind of just overview. These are the initial things. So, um, yeah. And then, of course, check-ins. So we're not going to wait a whole quarter to talk to parents and get feedback. And it, it, things will, yes, be improved. Um, Scenario two is basically in-person, one day, 
and another day you will be learning from home, so that's a hybrid. And Ashley's going to pass out a prototype hybrid calendar, and basically kids are in person two days a week, um, two different groups of kids, A and B, and then the fifth day of the week uh, is online, and we're going to be boosting the graphics. I can't remember the overall count, but... And another class two program, sorry. So in scenario one, I must have just missed that piece. So they can either be in person or they can opt out for a totally distance learning for the first quarter. It will be parents' choice completely. Um, again, we don't know what scenario between one and two that, well, or it could be three that MDE will tell us. But these are the three options that MDE said plan for. So again, it's kind of that overview of thinking through things, trying to keep parents in the loop. Uh, that's why we sent out the parent survey last week so parents can start thinking because come the decision by MDE, we need parents to tell us ASAP, here's what I want, because we have to, we have a lot of work we need to plan accordingly then, so. And then. Ashley really talked about the balance of the statement in order, but do we feel confident that if we get a, we get a decision on the 27th, that we're gonna be ready yes. for new teacher? Okay, mm -hmm. <laughs> I'm just asking the question. And here's why, here's why. <laughs> March, we had like 10 minutes, okay, when I said we'd be going in, okay, so we're going to have more than 10 days at this point, but the other thing I want you to consider is this as a board, you know, University of Notre Dame has moved their start date up to August 10th, the University of Minnesota students aren't coming back to school after Thanksgiving, um, McAllister's mm -hmm. same thing, because the more instruction we can better off we're going to be because once flu season starts, we're not only going to be dealing with COVID symptoms, we're going to be dealing with flu symptoms, which may be similar to COVID symptoms. And so I think we're going to have opportunities for more in-person instruction if we start in August than if we wait and then we'll take it. We'll take it. And then going to come up here and she's not going to get probably too much into the details of it, but we are going to have a team that meets every morning. It'll be me, Kathy, the school nurses, and we're going to take a look at cases, okay, we have six teachers today, okay, what are the symptoms that we're dealing with here? We have six students today, um, what are the symptoms? We have, uh, one of the great things that from, from summer school, and this is really why I pushed us going to summer school, is we were tested this summer on, okay, kid gets COVID, all right, how 
of that he's supposed to impact the building, the classroom. Uh, some, a family member had COVID. And so it, it really helped us factor some decision making and, and uh, um, testing that we, we learned from. Uh, and so now, and that was 100 kids. And now we're going to have 3,500 kids or 3,400 kids, whatever, whatever the number is. And so we're going to be having more, one, um, daily Zoom meetings with the school nurses. Okay, where are we at? And then we'll be working with the administrators to send out a communication with the impacted families. And if we start to get a lot in a school, um, we'll have to make a decision on, okay, we need to shut the school down or we're just internal. Um, so that we have a plan for that. Um, and we will have a, a, a team of medical professionals with administrators um, in place to address that. So, so basically, real quick, they teacher test positive. They they're out for 14 days until they can until they don't have any more symptoms. Uh, the uh, students in the classroom, we'll, they will interact and get a, are out 10 10 days completely. We would have to check to see who the teacher is interacting with amongst the yeah. staff. So um, the students are out for how many days? At least 10. Yeah. These are the okay. questions that people are talking about. Yeah, and there's and there's guidance from. On this, okay. That uh, we will be sharing once uh, the, the information is released as far as what we'll be doing in school. Uh, but it is a very so just we're out for what as many classes are there. Yes. Is there daily testing or anything from there? Any we we, would, or we are going forward with the thermal scanner, and, and there's two two pieces of good news there. One, we can pay for those through the COVID money that we got from the feds. Two. The county might be able to pay for them because the county got like $2 million and part of that money is supposed to flow through the school district. So if a kid comes in hot on the thermal scanner, they're immediately pulled aside and interviewed a, in more depth and detail. And again, I think we can address that more about that um, scanner from the county. Uh, just a quick question on the hybrid. Um, if, if you're doing hybrid, is it K-12, or when you look at a hybrid, I'm just really fearful for the K-1, 2, the, the education and learning. Is there any way those kids can be in school right away, especially for that first quarter, just to build the foundation, or are we going to have to look at it that, okay, K-12, everybody's a hybrid back and forth? I just raise that question around the county. I just wonder if they could be on it. Looking at K-12 at this point, um, but let's let's just be frank. Then. Comment on that would be let's see what they tell the superintendent. Right. Yeah. See, if if we were to confront the hybrid situation, that is going to be confusing enough. Then if you add to it, oh, K, this is except for K-1 or K-2 or K-3 on Thursday, or you know, nobody's going to be able to keep track of it. So, so, so let me ask the board that question. That's something we're, we're, we're talking about putting into the survey to, to get feedback from the community on what their thoughts would be. What, I'm just trying to think from a, from a daycare perspective. Uh, is it easier to plan a couple days a week? Or is it easier to plan for a week at a time? And then from an educational perspective, is it good for kids to miss a week of school in person completely and then come back for, you know, it could be four days either way, four days one week, four days the next week. Uh, so, so that's, that, and as we've created a, and these are all things I'm bringing up to share with you today, but we've created a calendar that we plan it every other week calendar as well. From an education angle, it's harder to miss a week of school and then come back. Um, but, but 
we can, I mean, we certainly can ask for feedback from the community. Uh, Corey has been two days with ten members here today. And, you know, I mean, besides that, I don't know of any way we could go into that. I just didn't know how that would make it more for the kids. Because at least you wouldn't know when you have four days, you can have five days. If mm -hmm. you're missing them with five, then you're going to miss them all day. Right. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I think from the, I mean, the educational standpoint, I think we thought at least if we're catching them in person two days a week, and they're, if they're the Monday-Tuesday group, they're home for the rest of the week, and then the Wednesday-Thursday groups are, that at least we're seeing them more frequently than a week on, week off, because that would be more concerning, I think. I think you're going to have a I think there is going to be issue with child care. There's going to be issues with parents that are working from home. You know, when you work from home, it's easier to maybe, you know, a, a day here, a day there, or half a day here, half a day there, but to say for a week I need to be, you know, if you don't have child care. Mm -hmm. You know, I think the, the working from home and the child care is going to be an issue potentially. You have to help have the answer for it, right? One of the concerns out of scenarios two and three here, if they direct that they're going into distance learning or hybrid Department of Education, under their current guidance, and I don't know if it's going to stay the same, and I've, I've already had some pretty significant conversations at the state level on this. Under their current guidance, as you can see in scenario two there, we are required to provide full aged care for critical workers. The problem with that is the definition of critical worker keeps on expanding. So suddenly now we are going to be providing full day, full day of school, we're unsure what that looks like yet. And in addition to that, we are going to have to be providing care for the children of critical workers. I don't have the space or the staff to do that. <coughs> Can we not reimburse you for that? No. And how is that different from having them? Right, and that's, that's, that's the other part of that discussion. So, in the Thursday, and that question was asked, and they kind of punted. Well, we'll, we'll get back to you. Um, but that's a real concern for the district, because when we were secure distance learning, yes, I had people available to do it. But now that if I'm doing distance learning, in-person learning, and we are giving full age care, I don't know we're going to do it. Can you collaborate with them for one and two? To some degree, we can. But again, we're not. And, and the, the difference is this, and hopefully they'll do it like they did this summer. They, the summer district, if they ran the program, which we didn't, could charge for it. So when we could hire people, it's an easier thing. But again, I think that the bigger issue for us is the next phase. And they can't be absorbed into the students who are just coming during that 50% max yeah. occupancy. or have some questions that may be a little bit more shy, or whatever, something's going on, or they're not understanding something else you want to bring into the, the teacher the next day. And the teacher can check in with them. I think that's really probably vital, actually. Um, and then I guess another question with all that, if we have a family who has, has a kid in elementary, <laughs> middle school, and high school, or something, a scenario like that, we're going to try real hard for yes. Yes. Absolutely. Yes. Uh, in response to the to a future questionnaires polling our parents community, have have we considered polling our staff? What do they think about? It? Well, we so we started with the ALEA reps last Tuesday, and again now more staff will be coming on as we keep building this. I don't know, Mike. At the uh, calendar level, um, we've got feedback. I, I think the polling we got was feedback from summer school, but it wasn't a, a generic, you know, how, how would we hybrid work in summer school? Um, but I, I don't think we surveyed the staff on whether they wanted a two-day-a-week model or four-day. And, and the reason we didn't seem to, uh, it's more impactful to families, I thought, uh, than it would be. But, but Neil, what happens regardless of the model, whether it's hybrid um, or distance learning or in person, the 
building is that came with that speaker in the building. Are going to be planning what things are going to look like within the building. So we're, we're just, at this point, we're putting together things, a skeleton of what his help might be laid out, and we're asking them to work with their with their technical hands to do something on this one. The other challenge, too, is since the hybrid went into busing, I don't know if the governor changes uh, what he's allowing on the bus right now. Don't, don't touch base on that. I'll finish up because a lot of the stuff now you're asking is they'll answer that. No, no, it's okay. Um, so distance learning, obviously we know what that model looks like. We've talked about what that needs to improve or how we need to improve it, what things worked, et cetera. So I, I, unless you have questions, I won't. I just have a short one. So scenario two, will parents also have the option to go completely? Yes. Okay. Thank you. Um, and then just the last slide is, okay, as a district, what does professional development look like for an entire year? Because we plan, you know, professional development out based on the needs, et cetera. So sc school social workers have been working on becoming um, a, a trauma-informed school for the last couple of years. They've done a lot of trainings, went to trainings. They now have a staff development plan for each building. So that will be coming out, perfect timing because we can now add distance learning to that as um, we know that is causing trauma on, on families and children as well. Uh, mental health will continue with cultural competence. Um, obviously, anti-racism and equity is uh, a big piece this year. And last year, we started with cultural competence, and it was really the, the beginning stages of assessing our own unconscious bias and what is unconscious bias and how do we move forward. And we included all staff in that, paras, EAs, custodians. And so now we're moving on to the next step of um, what is equity and um, et cetera, digging deeper into that. And then we've already talked about the last one. Uh, building leadership teams are going to be a big part moving forward on what does our instructional plan look like for next year. And then with that will come the PD that's needed. So whether it's training, um, staff on the online platform, students, et cetera, et cetera. A lot of planning has to go into what it looks like when we get the year started. So, And that's all going to happen in the next couple of weeks as we start pulling teachers in now to start planning. So, and Are there any um, group um, educations to be done on cultural competency in the near future? Is like, there any what, sir? Uh, a, a big group uh, staff education. Oh, where we can include... Um, you know, we're looking at a couple different things. I've reached out to all the big nine schools just to see what they're doing as well. And no big group is planned yet. And so our plan is when we get together with our first uh, team meeting is, actually talked to Mike about this today, can we put this on the agenda and look at some of the options to determine what do uh, teachers and admin think is the next step for that, that cultural competence? Because there's a, there's a lot of good things out there, but what do we see it as our next step? And I plan on meeting with all the administrators and purchasing a book called White Rage, which is really a white rage. It's, it's a societal history of how since the Civil War, white individuals have passed policies, rules, laws, insightful perspective on, on our history is kind of why we are where we are today. So it's a uh, chairman of an office named White Rage. Really, really excellent. I just heard some feedback on the, the training that was done uh, last year. It sounds like it was done by you know a white um, <laughs> a white female, and some of the pieces of it just sounded like I would just want to be cautious moving ahead that we don't have any pieces that would be revictimizing to um, to any ethnic groups or or religious um, believing people. I'm glad Jill brought that up. I probably heard from a completely different individual that there were some issues with uh, the other training as well that I heard. We did, we did get, there was a feedback form afterwards. And, um, yep, some was pretty, it, it, I think it's relatively 
too, I was like, whoa, because I think, I think my conscious bias is that, well, I'm not racist, yeah, but we all have biases, yeah. and so, yeah. So, um, yeah, the <laughs> next part of this is uh, vulnerable populations. And um, of course, we know we have students and staff who both uh, fall into this. And so um, certainly, we know that under special education, again, awaiting guidance from the Department of Ed uh, for what we can and can't offer on site for students with special needs or 504. Um, you know, they changed their mind a couple times over summer school. And so what we started with and then we ended up with um, looked a di little different than their first guidance. So. Um, we will wait and see. Um, and so, again, a plan in place to address requests for alternative learning arrangements. So um, special education, dealing with students on IEPs, what does that look like? Um, we know that distance learning is available for any family who wants it. And then what does that look like? Who are those instructors? Uh, and I'll talk about that in a second. Um, evaluate all plans for accommodating the students and update as needed on their IEPs or 504s and then off, offer distance learning to enrolled students who may be medically vulnerable or unwilling to return in person or hybrid. So, um, you know, we start with educating our students, staff and families with the signs and symptoms of COVID-19 and we know that there's been a lot out there. We just need to make sure we take those checklists and send them out and our school nurses have done some work on that. Um, We've done a single um, survey of um, licensed staff only at this point, kind of under the guidance of some training that came out from um, one of the, uh, the state MASPA organization. We have to be careful that we don't, can't require employees to give us medical information, yet we know we have some that are vulnerable. And in the spring, we waited for teachers to come forward and say, I I'm reading the literature and I have an underlying medical condition and I can't be on site for those two weeks that we did the 10 days of planning. And so we worked with all of them the same way, required medical documentation, um, documented that. Uh, everyone I reviewed with uh, the superintendent and then we communicated back with the employee. Not enough here. Uh, and for the most part, most of those were accommodated, but some we didn't have enough information. And so under the American with Disabilities Act, we want to make sure we treat them all the same. So this time around, because we know we can't ask people to send us medical um, information unless they tell us, we've reached out to all employees, uh, to all teach licensed staff and said, do you have a documented underlying medical condition that would prohibit you from coming on site to do one-on-one -on -one distance learning? And that's the only question we've asked at this time. Um, and they could only answer yes. So I don't want to be inundated with all the no's. I just want to know the yeses. And we have about 10 right now. Several concerns from the uh, teacher's unit, and we've talked with uh, ALEA leadership. Once we get guidance from the Department of Ed, we will then continue to ask more questions. But right now, that's kind of where we're at, because we don't want to violate anybody under the American Disabilities Act and other laws that are out there. Um, so then, um, we will have some conversations with those staff. Um, you know, if, if we're doing, if, if we need distance learning, which we know we're going to have, you know, a certain percentage of our students who want that, and I've got these 10 teachers who want to, who need to work from home, then more than likely you are going to be the distance learning teacher or you're going to have to do something from home that we can provide that accommodation for. So, um, so we're going to move forward with that after next week. And I'm, there's a state organization, MASPA, that uh, all school districts have been providing a lot of good information. Three or four different legal um, school legal organizations have been providing resources. So um, we have a process for staff to self-identify. Um, that's the question that we asked. Uh, we will put a p plan in place. Um, as soon as we find out the governors, we've already contacted the ALEA leadership. We'll discuss with admin and ALEA leadership regarding staff assignments of individuals who consider themselves high risk. So just a little perspective. There are a lot of scared people out there right now. Lots of them. And we have a population of teachers <coughs> range from 22 to probably 50. So if you're looking at high 
high risk, okay, the older you are, the, the higher your risk. And so, and then of course, as Kathy has already surveyed the staff, our under, underlying medical physicians, we also have some staff members that have family members who are more at risk, and so they don't want to bring it home to their family member who may be more at risk. So our intent is to survey parents to see what percent of them want to go all in or not. I mean, you saw the results here a few minutes ago that just 17% at the time. I think based upon the, the spike in, in COVID, you're gonna see somewhere from 20 to 30%. I think is the more family question that we're gonna put on our list. Once they identify how many students are gonna start online, then we're gonna have to meet with the principals, with the ALEA, and say, okay, here are the needs of our online students. I've already identified John Zubel as the guy who's going to be really kind of uh, the go-between with online and the parents and the staff. So he's, gonna, he's really gonna be running with that. Um, and um, we are gonna build an online school, basically, for those people who want to be truly online. We're gonna meet with the, the ALEA and okay, who are your high risk concerned folks who have real concerns about coming back to school in, in an in-person setting? So we'll meet with them, we will identify the staffing needs and the, uh, the report and, uh, based upon the, uh, uh, the urgent needs with the, within our student population at K-12. So, um, so really I had a, a couple good conversations with Al Roberson over the last week or so. Um, Al, we're gonna work on this together. We're not gonna put teachers who may be at risk in a school building and, and expose them. Um, and, and you know, I read stuff online about you know, teachers putting their wills together as a look at they may be going home. We want, as I stated to you, it was for the board goals for the upcoming year. Our recommendation in the administration we want to stay to the mind stay to the school needs and so we are very uh, open to working with, with folks who are really uh, concerned about family and I have a including the most recent agenda we had on family member that's high risk yes yep so I have a question um, you know you look at <laughs> staffing it that way and other schools are going to staff it that that way, potentially. So, you know, there's a lot of advertisements out there, you know, of other sources of online learning and so on. Does MBE ever say, you know, we're gonna come out and we're gonna, we'll pro provide a system in Minnesota where f students at home can, can do, it, do it online? And they don't, I mean, I, I see the staffing and you're, you're staffing a lot of people there that potentially, if there was a system available, yeah, would they make don't more have sense. Like that yet. And really, the only guidance they're going to be providing families is there are online schools out there. And if you don't want to go to school in your district, here's the Minnesota Virtual Academy. Here's this school if you, if you want to do it that way. But that doesn't help us out because we still have our staff. And so we've had probably more phone calls in the last few weeks on how do I sign up for an online school than um, we've had for I want to be come out home school. I want to go home school in the morning. That I'm just going to have to do the evaluating because if we have a lot of teachers that are going to go virtual, and all of a sudden you're taking them out of the classroom, so now you have to fill that classroom. So hopefully staffing is aware that changes are going to occur, but we're under a crisis situation right now. So and, and the, yeah, so we're gonna, and we may have to have some flexibility on licensing. And, and, but that's a conversation we're gonna have with the ALEA. Um, and, and I think the state's okay with that because of the fact that um, this is a um, pandemic still happening in our world. Uh, but I, I can't be uh, certain enough that, you know, the safety of everybody is, is paramount to us. Going to put a staff member who's at risk to, to some degree uh, in a 
building that the sun was standing on. But that's a little bit. Thank you, Brad. Thank you. And I was rather surprised on the comments earlier that there weren't more teachers actually um, who had a video of themselves teaching. I guess I, for some reason I thought most of them were doing that. I was really surprised. Um, so, and I can understand the, the parents' point, but my question is, and I know this might be uncomfortable for staff, but for the, t for the staff that is in the classroom teaching, can they just have a recording, um, can they do their own recording of themselves that can go on some platform that only their kids can access or these, or the staff that's feeling unsafe that's at home, can they do that to provide more of that uh, teacher teaching aspect? One of the things we've discussed, and again, we're gonna, this is gonna be a, probably a billion level type decision. We have some devices called swivel cameras within the district that basically you put an iPad on a, on a swivel and the teacher has a microphone and the, it follows the teacher wherever they're walking in the room, it follows them and it broadcasts what is happening. So if the teacher's there teaching the lesson, then a kid at home can be sitting there watching and listening to the lesson and they can record it or it can be out. So that is something that, uh, that's in our toolbox that we did not utilize because we had no in-person components last uh, uh, spring, but that we're taking a look at. They also can use Screencastify and record a lecture. Everybody will have that. One of the things Mary Jo is, has been doing with some of our, our, our tech staff is, okay, what else do we need to be more successful? What, what did we have that wasn't successful? Schoology, not so successful. Google Classroom, successful. Screencastify. Um, Southwest really um, stepped up with a couple of different options that maybe we need to know, look at 312 or K-12 or so, yeah. And even if school or even a building was shut down for, um, for the virus um, and it was just strictly distance learning, does, can staff come into their own classroom where all of their tools are and record themselves if the kids aren't there? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So we were talking, what was our first plan last spring? And that was for staff to come in on site and teach the kids at home, and then that changed. So, you know, hopefully another <laughs> option, 42. So I, I had colleagues, uh, well, around 2010 that were already doing that. Mm -hmm. I mean, that was, and that was, we had face-to-face -face instruction, but they recorded lessons yeah. and made them available online for their students. Yeah, and we do have some who still do that. But uh, back to the issue that well, uh, Ken raised it and Mike answered that there already are outfits out there that will provide distance learning, online learning. We need to be concerned about that. There, there's a large list. We had better have a, ver a stellar online program so that we can compete because uh, I would assume that if this elderly student avails themselves of that service, then we're not getting state aid for that student. I'm assuming the uh, parents of students in our district that, that want to pursue that course are going to have to pay for it. No? It's no? Open enrollment. It's, 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 a regular trip that's it's worse than I thought. <laughs> <laughs> so am I understanding this right, Mike? You were saying that if, like basically the distance learning, those who chose that, it'll be kind of like a separate school. They won't be like in the same classes as the kids. Right. Okay, that's how I understood that, just double checking. The, the hybrid learning piece though, one of the options that we're looking at is through a swivel instruction of, hey, you could be at home, you could be watching what's going on in the class and while you're there. That's our way of saying that that's one of the steps. And the key to that is that uh, not only online assignment is there, but it doesn't exclude the in-person learning. No. requiring us to have an online component for whatever we provide. Mm -hmm. So that's basically what we're doing. We're creating a, you know, a K-12 online lesson. 
so the students would remain and you know if they're Lakeview student first quarter with uh, John Smith and they would decide to come back second quarter they you know we'd look at the staffing and they'd still return to their school um, you know all that Mars reporting and all that we we're trying to keep it as sane as possible so we basically are looking you know the executive order 2074 work from home is still in place so hoping the governor will whatever he decides um, Moving forward, we look at EEOC, American Disability Act. Um, NEA has come out with a um, lots of documents that we've reviewed, and we're pretty, you know, they're they're pretty similar to what we're hearing from the Department of Health and the Department of Ed. And I'll tell you, the Department of Health it was really spectacular to work with this summer. So, you know, what happens when the teacher is exposed? As group A is exposed, group B is not. Um, and uh, school nurses did a really good job initially, and then. Department of Health did a great job walking us through that. Lawrence maybe with uh, one of our school nurses really in particular did just a really great job. So we have some good experience. So let's go back a slide actually. So one more, this one. Right there. So Kathy, you, you moved on to the second slide and blew the stuff, the text <laughs> messages up. But, um, but if you go there for illness, you'll see that staff and students stay at home if they tested positive. Those are some of the procedural things that we are receiving from the Department of Health that uh, for screening purposes <coughs> and, uh, and kind of some of the procedural stuff yeah. that goes along with that. You know, and our, our COVID team, really, we know this is going to be student and staff interaction. So we want it to be from the HR point of view as well as their school nurses who work with students in buildings and then contact with the building admins. Um, so. Um, some districts are designating a person, hiring a person. We just feel like this team would work well from both those vantage points. So if the teacher has to go home for 10 days and their students have to go home for 10 days, then that probably would be the distance learning teacher for those students, potentially, if that teacher wasn't ill, you know, and just exposed. So it's, we're going to be, we're going to have to do what the Department of Health tells us to do. And so we want to be prepared. Like I said, we had really good experience with summer school and how to deal with this issue, this issue, this issue, this issue. We're building templates so we aren't, you know, waiting for somebody's got to get that letter translated and somebody's got to get that letter translated. So we're, we're trying to be prepared early on. Um, success coaches this summer made phone calls as we needed to be um, and work closely with our school nurses. So. So students, staff, vulnerable populations, staffing issues, working with uh, NEA guidelines, state guidelines, EEOC guidelines. Um, so that's kind of my COVID. Yeah, you can just buzz through. I'll just buzz through. <laughs> this is just kind of where we're going through next year, which I've kind of sent in board updates, uh, which uh, groups are up for bargaining this next year. A little bit about technology. All of our students have their Chromebooks or iPads at home this summer. We will be replacing, we already had in our budget to replace a thousand Chromebooks. They are going into the elementary three through five carts. Uh, and then we also have iPads ordered to replace K2. So our, those kiddos can keep their devices at home and we will have devices that will stay at school this fall. Um, two of our buildings, Halverson and Hawthorne, got an amazing grant uh, and were able to uh, also pur purchase iPads for grade three for some STEM work and um, so that is in the process. We're not sure when it's going to start, but we'll have that. We'll bring that information to the board of that. It's great news for the district. It's, um, it's staff will and principal come yeah. and talk to the teachers a little bit. It's a pretty amazing grant. All of our staff, desk, staff desktop computers have all been upgraded in either last year or this summer. Um, all of our printer systems, uh, Jennifer Walsh worked with the printer company uh, that we purchased from. We have new uh, printer systems around the district. Um, and we've gone away from building tech coaches this next year to a district-wide tech coach. So Burke Egner, who's been to the board before, um, he will have one hour release time plus a stipend on Schedule C. Uh, he's already been working this summer like crazy to identify tech tools district-wide for access. Uh, I think one of the things principals told us this summer was all of my teachers had to step up tech-wise and learn technology in a way they maybe didn't have to in the past. And so now we'd like to... You know, this is not the big Kenneth position. This is a teacher. Uh, he's still teaching five hours a day. He will not do a supervision, and he'll get a stipend. So right now he's identifying tech tools, and, and he's working with us to build virtual onboarding. 
um, for our teacher, three teacher days in addition to, um, you know, Ashley's virtual onboarding of all of our employees if it's not face-to-face. -face. So um, really trying to hone in on technology, um, kind of a more dis district-wide approach and a um, little bit of a cost saving certainly to the district. Uh, and that's me. I'm going to have to talk so fast. Okay, so I'm going to talk a little bit about systems that we're putting in place to ensure a safe environment. You know, one of our biggest challenges is going to be transportation. There's no question about that. Um, scenario one, which is the in-person learning for all students, what MDE is telling us at this time, if that is our scenario, that we have to create as much space between students as possible on buses. And they understand, however, that a six foot radius may not be possible, but that we should consider ways of reducing our capacity. So one thing that the board might wanna consider is um, taking our current policy on our walk zone for elementary students and increase that from one mile to the state I won't say recommendation, but the, by law, we have to pro provide transportation at two miles. So we could move that from one mile to two miles. You know, if you look at that scenario, I'd be asking if there's any convenience for some families, if there's some emergency that you can look at. But for the sake of the district, if a majority of the parents are wanting their kids back in school, we're going to have to find some way to escape. And this right. might be one avenue. Uh, I don't like the idea of going to two miles. It might be a win-win to, to, to help get them going for now. But still, if there's a busy street, that that's their cutoff, right? Well, or we not. would probably still keep, okay. yes, keep our hazards. Now, you know, Bridge Street going to Hawthorne, that's going to be closed anyway. So I think right now that is a hazard. Maybe that wouldn't need to be if we have, you know, if there's no traffic there. But Dick and I were talking today, yes, hazards would still be in place. And he just doesn't know, um, without really digging into his program, exactly how many students that would take off the routes. So scenario two, hybrid learning. Yeah. Right. You know, I don't think I don't think there is a scenario. I don't think there is a case if we are in scenario one, unless lots of families would. Um, agree to just drive their students to school that we could get to six feet. Um, scenario two, hybrid learning. Uh, what our guidance is from that is that we would limit occupancy to 50%, but that we would have to um, allow or keep the six foot distancing. So that might even reduce it more than 50%. Now families can sit together, uh, but we may not be able to do 50% and six foot. It might be something less than 50%. Uh, the bus company currently enters into private contracts with families who are within the walk zone who want transportation, but we would, we would not be able to allow that. We will probably recommend limiting families to one pickup and drop off Per student so right now we allow families to say okay on you know Monday I want this pickup and this drop-off but on Thursdays and Fridays they need something different but we're gonna really have to manage the students who are on our buses and honestly it's best practice to limit it just helps us keep track of our students so much better well except we can't, no. they aren't available and there are no drivers available to no. do that. I think, is it 30 of the drivers are over 65? Yeah, we have a large number. Now we've had very few say at this point that they won't be returning, but I'm sure just like the rest of us, they're waiting to hear the guidance of what it's gonna look like. Um, it is definitely an older population. Also for busy roads, could you be looking at 
We could, that would be, yeah, that would be a potential too if we would have a crossing guard that would eliminate those physical, those barriers. Um, buses will be clean and sanitized between each use and our thought now is that all students without regard to grade would be required to wear a mask on the bus, especially under scenario one. whatever reason, I'm just going to get that to move. Oh, it is, I'm sorry, I'm looking at mine, because my glasses, I either have to wear my close glasses or my far away glasses, and right now I'm wearing my close glasses. Okay, food service. Uh, scenario one, in-person learning. So in this case, elementary students will be eating their meals in the classroom. Uh, we will have to discuss what supervision is going to look like, because normally that's a time that teachers have time off. We are still working on a plan for Southwest in the high school of where students would eat lunch that we could maintain the six foot distance. Uh, instead of touching a common keypad to put in their account numbers, we've already ordered and received scanners and we will be having barcodes with their ID numbers on their student IDs. And so We'll do, that's a great system anyway, so that we will just be scanning their barcodes. Quicken It'll quicken everything a lot, especially at the elementary school. Can that be used under COVID expenses? Yes, yeah. yes, it can. Or food service. Right now I'm putting it in food service. But if, needed. if needed, it could. Hybrid learning, uh, students on site will follow the scenario one procedures, and then we will either send home breakfast and lunch for the students who are in school on the bus home with them for the next day or we will have um, pickup available at each school site. Does that mean it's inside the school or? We would probably set up something outside like we did yeah. this spring. Now obviously when we get into the winter that might have to look a little bit different but we would have pickup at each site. And this is assuming that the children can behave with their food on the buses, because that can also cause a whole new set of problems. Well, what will happen with the families that if they have no transportation? So if, if they, well, A, we're gonna also have children that are doing 100% distance learning, so they will have the ability to pick up food at the site, or we will certainly, because though our buses are going to be engaged under scenarios one and two, how we get food out beyond our sites is something that we will have to, to look into what, you know, if the county would have something available. You know, we talked about, um, you know, we've got meals that are meals on wheels for mm -hmm. the system. Maybe we can partner with some of our community agencies to help. Right. Do something yeah, smart bus. Summer, of the okay. And then scenario three, which is distance learning, um, we would do something very similar to what we did last spring, where we would have sites out amongst uh, our neighborhoods where students can pick up and families can pick up their food. Okay, building safety and cleanliness. I'm sorry, I have a question. Yes. Yes. Is that available for everyone or just certain groups? Which kind of available to Well, we are hoping that what we are, what is being floated and what we're hearing as a possibility is that actually all meals for all students there will be no charge for. That has not been decided. If that is not the case, then we would have to track. You know, are we sending, if we're sending meals home with students who pay, we would have to charge their account for sending those meals home or if they come pick them up. If they qualify for free reduced meals, then obviously they would pick up and there would not be that charge. But we just don't have the guidance yet of what waivers are going to be in place for, for food service. Might might be a possibility, but I wouldn't be spreading that around because right. we don't we don't know yet. But 
we're there's some sp speculation that that might be the case. Yes, yes, very good thing. Okay, uh, building safety. So for scenarios one and two, we will be stocking each classroom with disinfectant spray bottles and paper towels. You know, our custodians will certainly be spending extra time on high touch areas, but we don't anticipate that they would have the time to go into each classroom every day and wipe everything down. So we will have to look to staff and if appropriate students to help with some of that. And then one day a week under all of our scenarios we're talking about students would be at home and we would be able to do a deeper clean. We've already talked a little bit about our thermal scanning system. I did get an update from Steve that we are expecting delivery within two weeks and it will take one to two weeks for install but if that all comes to a fruition it will be in place by the first day of school. So there will be two scanners at the high school and one at each of the other buildings. We will have a portable unit at the ALC and a portable unit for the front door of the high school. The total cost is about $175,000. Right now we're, uh, we have it earmarked for COVID funds a little bit. We, can, we have some safe school funds we can also use. But I have been in contact with the county and hopefully we'll get have a meeting set up with them uh, this week or next week to talk about the possibility of getting some of their $3.7 million to pay for this. And they seem amenable to that. We got about 600000 Some of that we have to set aside for our non-publics, about 20000 And so... 560,000 or so at our disposal, but it, at first I thought, well, that's wonderful, but as these things are adding up, it's, it's going to go very, very quickly. So that 175 was a total of seven safety manuals from people that really had Correct. Two more closures? Yes. Okay. And right now, our thought is that all staff, all staff and students in grades 3 through 12 will be required to wear a mask, and we will be providing one washable mask to all of our staff members. So what are, you, what are your thoughts on kindergartners wearing masks, uh, first and second graders, almost everybody facing masks uh, with the younger kids? Is there a way that because they're in all the common areas, they wear their masks. So you're used to wearing it on the bus. You're used to wearing it when you come through the front door till they get to their classroom. Would it be a safe enough scenario with the numbers, especially in the elementary, that they're in their classroom, that they're available, um, that they wouldn't have to have them on because it's their normal group? Because if somebody from the outside comes in, uh, somebody that's brought to them and that they put them on otherwise because they're self-contained we've been trying to do that all summer in, in summer programming the common areas you got to wear them adults wear them kids wear them and then in their program area we're, we're letting them have them on mm -hmm. so they're active and doing sure. a lot of pressure i don't know if there's a right answer yeah and, and again i think this, this is a question that we've been having discussions with other folks you have to clean up you have to wear them i think this is one of the things we can talk through again at the building level what do you what do the buildings think about this and then we'll come up with a recommendation from an eye that um that uh um, can but at, least, but at a minimum i think we're looking at that as a, as a point and, and, and of course on the buses and, and in k-12 again how much are these kids the funny thing is the little kids think it's hilarious and great to wear. And the grandson ran to the dentist so the dad is got done and he saw everybody with a mask so he had to get one and then he wore it for two hours after hanging outside because he thought it was cool. So I think part of it will be an adjustment but I think overall <laughs> the younger ones are probably going to adapt better than the older Agreed. ones. Mm -hmm. 
at this point, I mean, we're ordering masks for people, for students who forget theirs, but it's not our intent, at least as of right now, that we would be providing masks for students. That would be part of, you know, just their list of things to bring. Okay, then the next. Uh, excuse me. Uh, yeah. That, that uh, I can see that as an obvious real problem for staff to enforce. Yes. We, we had a no hat policy, and that was a nightmare to enforce. We had a no cell phone policy. That was a nightmare to enforce. A uh, uh, requirement for a mask. I think it's, it should be required. But, I mean, this is a debate that's going on statewide, nationwide. Maybe by then we may have a state mandate. Well, it doesn't matter. It, well, true. It, it's the right thing to do, but as soon as you mandate something as the right thing to do, then it becomes an enforcement issue. It's a... It's a I have asthma. I can't wear a mask. Yeah. How do you determine anyone with asthma? What's that? How do you determine anyone with asthma? Well, we're supposed to be educators, and I guess this is an excellent area for us to educate our students, says he who's not wearing a mask right now. <laughs> <laughs> it would be an excellent way to model for our students, too, wouldn't it? Yeah. Right. <laughs> I forgot about my beautiful face. <laughs> All right. Additionally, we've ordered uh, highly visible floor decals to be placed uh, showing the six-foot distancing. Uh, wash your hands, uh, asking people not to enter the building if they are showing certain symptoms. We've ordered a lot of additional portable sanitizer units and obviously gallons upon gallons of hand sanitizer. Uh, we, we had two atomizers, and by atomizers, I mean those are the machines that spray out very, very fine mist of, of disinfectant. They are very difficult to get. We've got several on order. We just received another one, so we are, we're now at three. But those would be very quick ways to go into a classroom at the end of the day, and in literally a few seconds we could disinfect the room. You still have to go every once in a while and wipe down because you don't want that building up, but those units are very difficult to get. And we have ordered plexiglass partitions for our front offices and cafeterias, so between the office staff and, and families or students, we would have the plexiglass. For the heat and signage, anything we could do to make it more of a, a positive instead of you must be six feet apart, do it as spacing appreciated? Or? I think we, it, it's not a, it's, you know, I know it says thank you, you know, please stand six feet apart, thank you. It's oh, got. Thank you for spacing. Up. Yeah. I, People it wasn't, I, in fact, it, yeah, it's not a, it doesn't sound autocratic. It's more of a, uh, a friendly reminder, yeah. and this is what six feet looks like. Okay, so that's all that I have for systems to ensure a safe environment. Then I'm, I'm going to move on to the operating reference. Can I ask quickly about yeah. um, building then? It, has there been any new talk about increasing natural airflow and decreasing um, heating, airing, air cooling? Well, I, I know we have relatively new HVAC systems in all of our buildings, and that's what increase, increases your cubic foot per minute of airflow. Beyond that, I don't know of a way, and Mike, I don't know if you know, there's no way to increase that beyond the capability of the systems that we have, and we have relatively new systems. I, I think we have about as good a system as anybody at this point, that's why we can upgrade it. Mm -hmm. But I, I, I concur with, with Jennifer said, I don't think we can increase the flow uh, of air. Uh, Is, isn't it more about decreasing the flow? I think it's, ex I thought it was exchanging the air Especially within a room. Yeah. yeah, right, yeah. yeah. Probably an important piece of that is not having a lot of fans or <laughs> I know some teachers and individuals like them, but, but it messes up if, if you're the system. If you're in a classroom and you're not six feet apart and all of a sudden the fans are blowing, you know, you've got some very... Right. Um, I was in a Big Nine finance meeting on Friday and Winona, and maybe they're, they're probably not the only district, but has buildings, has two elementary schools that don't have dehumidification, also known as air conditioning. 
So you can imagine what the uh, ventilation would be in those buildings would be virtually non-existent other than whatever you get by opening a window. So we're, fortunately, we are not in that situation. Any other questions about that? Just uh, ironically looking at those potential delays before we start our regular meeting. What do you want to do? You could probably, what I would suggest you do is modify the agenda and add this. Or modify or, or, or take a break and then start your meeting at 5.15 or something. Okay. I think you've got some really important yeah. stuff that you've got to finish before. Yeah. The next part will take a few minutes. I'm sure you're going to have a lot of questions. Mm -hmm. So you're thinking maybe add it to the regular meeting just, agenda? Just so you know how you want to do it. You can add it. At the, the only thing we've got really on the regular part portion is the uh, athletic and the, re the report and the activities update. So the activities, uh, and you could add finance update. Um, you can do it as part of my report, but just do it that way. Okay. Oh, okay. Go ahead and take about a uh, ten-minute break. So about five ten, we'll. Leave.